Homer called Malta the center of the sea. This island, situated in the heart of the Mediterranean, was thus important to both the Orient and the Occident. Prehistory, with its primeval stone temples and tombs, is part of the great Menier culture. After the Phoenicians and the Punia came the Romans, followed by the Arabs and the Normans. But it was the Knights of Malta who made the most indelible mark here. Here, for thousands of years, faith, hope, and the imagination of various peoples created a veritable treasure trove of culture. Valletta is also known as the City of Palaces. It is Malta's main city, full of historic buildings. In 1530, the Order of the Knights of Malta moved its main residence to this section of the island. In subsequent years, the city's defences were further developed. Malta's proud capital city was one of the first in Europe to be officially planned and designed on a drawing board. The National Archaeological Museum contains various exhibits that date back to the Stone Age. Skulls and Magna Mater, priceless historic gems. The prehistoric Venus of Hadjaim is particularly noteworthy, an image of a sleeping woman. The St. John's Co-Cathedral was built in 1577 by Gerolama Cassar as a monastic church of the Order of the Knights of Malta. This religious building was ordained as a cathedral at the command of Pope Pius VII in 1816. Its splendid interior was financed by the profits gained from the order of the Knight of Malta's hostilities against Muslim trading ships. The floor is particularly splendid. The medieval crusaders of Christianity left their traces everywhere. The steep steps are reminiscent of nearby Sicily, and the gold yellow stone that is typical of Malta shines out brightly in the sunlight. Elegant and well-preserved buildings with the island's traditional balconies indicate that these were once the dwellings of the elite. One such building is the Museum of Fine Art. It's well worth a visit as it's one of the city's earliest palaces that once served as a residence for the order. The Grand Master's Palace is the Order's largest building. Its mighty walls, set within the austere architecture of the 16th century, are adorned with wooden alcoves of Baroque design. The magnificent armory corridor, with its wall paintings and knight's armour, highlights the Order's power and magnificence. Various portraits form a complete gallery of each of the Order's Grand Masters. The armory contains a fascinating collection of well-preserved armor and weaponry. The weapons and armor for 25,000 soldiers were once stored here, and several thousand items have survived to the present day. The lower Baraka Gardens on the bastion of the city wall are one of the city's few green areas. And there's a small Greek temple.
The Upper Baraka Gardens, located at the highest point of the city, provides a remarkable view across the Grand Harbour and its many fortifications. The former parade ground of the Maltese Knights is ideal for a stroll among numerous arcades, trees and fountains. This is one of the largest natural harbours in the world. It has been used for three millennia and was the reason why the Order of the Knights of Malta settled here. The fjord-like peninsulas on the opposite side were inhabited even earlier. Strong fortress walls rise up above the sea. Surrounded by a mighty surf that demonstrates the relentless power of nature both day and night. After the order had succeeded in fending off the Turks following the Grand Siege of 1565, the Grand Master Jean de la Vallette ordered that the entire island be fortified. Situated on the northernmost point of the peninsula is the famous St. Elmo Fort, a dominant feature of the coast. Throughout the centuries, it's been witness to many bloody battles and much courageous resistance. The War Museum is located in the northwestern section of the fort. The Sacra Infirmeria and its 160 meter long ward was the hospital for the Knights of St. John. It is one of the city's most remarkable buildings. The island's only theatre dates back to 1732. It's one of the oldest in Europe that is still in use today. And there's a particularly special attraction, Malta's old-timer bus service. Starting from the bus terminal at the city gate, they travel to each corner of the island. The colourfully decorated and shiny chrome buses are one of Malta's most popular and endearing modes of transport. The St Paul's Shipwreck Church was designed by Girolamo Casar. It is dedicated to the legendary shipwreck of Paul the Apostle. Magnificent frescoes feature the life of St. Paul, as well as various scenes inspired by the biblical account of the catastrophe that occurred just off the Maltese coast. And this head is a reminder of St. Paul's decapitation in Rome. The Pieta and Sliema yacht harbours are visible from the mighty walls of Valletta. These suburbs were founded less than a hundred years ago. Blossoming tourism and the love of the Maltese for the sea helped to transform these sheltered bays into yacht harbours. Excursion boats embark from Sliema Bay. Past a large island in the Bay of Mazamset. Here in Lazaretta, the crews of the ships who travelled from the Orient were kept in strict isolation for 40 days in order to avoid contamination from the plague. The natural harbour and fortified city are an equally impressive sight when viewed from the sea. The boat passes various fortified walls that extend into the sea. The papacy and various European dynasties contributed much finance to the project. Thus this massive bulwark of Christianity was built in only a few years. Valletta is still beautiful and picturesque. Small fishing boats float peacefully on the calm water of the bay and awake an image of old Venice. It is as though time has stood still. 
This little spit of land, Bergu, today's Vittoriosa, was one of the order's first settlements and was an ideal place for the defense of the harbor. Next to the former gunpowder magazine is the Baroque Church of San Lorenz that is believed to be the oldest church in Malta. Narrow lanes lead past the square of the Inquisitors, the Mishra Iriba, and the well-preserved inns of the knights. On its landward side, Vittoriosa is protected by a mighty wall. The town has entered through the Provence Gate. A heavy iron chain once spanned between Bergu and Sanglia. Thus hostile Turkish galleys were hindered from entering the bay. When the Knights of St. John first obtained their fiefdom from the Spanish monarchy, the Fort St. Angelo was a tiny fortress. It was subsequently expanded and improved. In May 1565, the Ottomans attacked with 200 ships and a cruel siege began that continued for four months. Although they suffered many casualties, the Knights withstood the larger forces of the Ottomans until the fleet arrived from Sicily and drove away the Sultan's army. Due to this victory, the further expansion of the Ottoman Empire was prevented and Malta became Europe's great Christian bastion of defense. The shipyards once provided work for more than 13,000 and 5,000 are still employed here today. A large variety of ships is maintained here. The Sanglia Peninsula is one of the three cities, small and peaceful, but of great historical importance. In 1530, the Knights of St. John founded their first base here, following their expulsion from the Mediterranean island of Rhodes. Churches, palatial buildings, shady steps and arcades situated alongside the water's edge are an impressive sight. The ambience of the Knights can still be felt here. Although it has few tourist attractions, Sanglia is probably the most beautiful city in Malta, with its many pretty balconies and almost non-existent traffic. When this peninsula was first inhabited, it was named after the French Grand Master Claude de la Sangle, and the settlement played an important role during the great siege of Valletta in 1565. Situated at the entrance to the harbour, Calcara is the island's third city, with a calm, picture postcard bay and beautiful buildings lined up along the quay. It's hard to imagine that the harbour was once heavily fortified. Today, both shipbuilders and fishermen share this naturally formed bay. Heavy bombing caused a great deal of damage during the Second World War, but most of the city's buildings that were affected were rebuilt according to their original design. The 
island's traditional fishing boat, the Lutsi, is manufactured here and modern yachts are also built in various small privately owned shipyards. During the Great Siege of 1565, the Turks established a military camp in Zabar. For four months, the Ottomans attempted to starve the Knights of St. John. 1797, the last Grand Master of Malta, Ferdinand von Hompesch, granted Zaba a town charter and gave it the title Sita de Hompesch. The Santa Maria de Grazia Church was also funded by the Order of St. John, in gratitude for their salvation from the Great Siege, and to honor the Holy Virgin Mary. Construction work took more than 100 years, which perhaps explains a certain lack of harmony in the architecture, although its beauty is nevertheless plain to see. Figures of life-size saints, pillars and abundant decorations make this church one of the most beautiful Baroque buildings on the island. The present dome originated much later, after the original dome had been damaged by a cannonball. Malta's temples are older than the Egyptian pyramids. This tiny Mediterranean island is a veritable archaeological treasure trove. Malta's largest prehistoric temple site is situated in Tarshin. It consists of three interconnected buildings. The remains of the religious sanctuary were discovered in 1914. Local farmers stumbled across huge blocks of stone while plowing their fields. Subsequent excavation of the site revealed several remarkable prehistoric finds, such as fragments of pottery, stone images, and a large number of urns. They date back to around 3300 to 2400 BC. Marzachloch, the prettiest fishing village in Malta, a rural idyll in the south of the island. Hundreds of colourfully painted fishing boats or lutzi lie at anchor in the sheltered bay. The fishermen check their nets as well as their most recent catch. Each day, a picturesque market takes place on the quay. A large variety of produce is on sale here, especially vegetables and fruit, and of course, fresh fish straight from the fishing boats. The inhabitants of Valletta also come here to buy the delicious seafood, either as it comes or specially boned and filleted. Colourful houses on the quayside contain romantic cafes and restaurants with tables laid out al fresco. Mazascala on the east coast is a popular holiday resort. A long bay protects the harbour in which many colourful fishing boats lie at anchor. White church tower indicates the origin of this once small fishing village. Of course, the harbour of the Sicilians had to have its own Catholic church. Today, 2,000 people live here. 
that during the summer months, many local people as well as tourists come to bathe on Mazascala's beautiful beaches. Numerous renovated houses are located around the bay, with images of saints on the walls, traditional balconies and rush mats to protect from the sun's rays. The existence of the prehistoric site of Hadsha'im has long been in the history books. But scientific excavation of the rocky terrain here began much later, in the middle of the 19th century. At that time, only the largest blocks of stone were visible. The temple area and those of its rocks that have been partially decorated with geometrical forms extends across an area of several hundred meters. These massive rocks raise the question of how those who brought them to this location were able to transport such heavy material here 4,500 years ago. However, new light has been shed on this. It's believed that the island's early inhabitants used small circular rocks on which they laboriously moved these heavy objects. The idyllic atmosphere of the temple attracts both people and animals alike. It has been quite well preserved, thus it provides a fascinating insight into the ancient building techniques of megalithic culture. Below Hadsha'im are the ruins of Manidra. This is the only prehistoric site in Malta and its formations appear to contain a precise alignment with the stars. Only when the hours of both day and night are identical does the light of the rising sun shine into the far corner of the sanctuary. However, a number of scientists are not convinced that the alignment of the rocks and their association with the stars was created intentionally, because such precision would be almost impossible to determine in those bygone times. How much was known of the stars by those who lived here so long ago? However, it seems that 5,000 years ago they had accumulated a good degree of knowledge. Worship of the gods and worship of the dead were closely associated. Thus, both the above-ground and subterranean ritual rooms of the temples of megalithic culture served both purposes. The old city of Medina sits regally upon a high plateau in the center of the island, surrounded by hilly and fertile farmland. In Arabic, Medina means a place of religion. The old Punye settlement was transformed into a fortress by the Arabs. Here, they sat in judgment of the people. A Norman, Duke Roger, had this cathedral built and he also introduced the European feudal system to this region. This gave rise to the Maltese nobility, In the Middle Ages, the Knights of St. John arrived. 
But the town soon lost its importance and it gradually became the Sita Vecchia, the old town. The old and dignified centre of the Maltese nobility now stands proud amid the hustle and bustle of the island's tourists. Today, several palaces are still owned by various of Malta's old families. The narrow lanes between the medieval buildings provide welcome shade in the heat of summer and also a degree of security. Following a devastating earthquake in 1693 that also damaged the old bishop's seat, most of the town was once again completely rebuilt. The town's important fortified walls were continuously extended by the various rulers of the day. And now there are wonderful views to the north of the island. A dark chapter in the history of Medina was the conquest of Malta by Napoleon, who robbed it of many precious works of art. During the era of British colonial rule, the town fell into relative obscurity for 130 years until the world's tourist industry came knocking on its door. Horses trot across the cobblestones. With a little imagination, this could well have been the carriage of the magician Cagliostro, who served Grand Master Pinto in the 17th century. Today, only 500 people live here in what is tantamount to being an open-air museum. They still cling to their age-old traditions. The Dingley Cliffs are a fascinating sight. A steep sloped rocky coastline on the western shore, close to Medina. There are only a few narrow pathways that lead down the steep cliffs to the narrow strip of privately owned agricultural land at the bottom. From here, there's a magnificent view of the cliffs and the sea, and although there's a strong wind, it's extremely quiet here compared to Malta's busy tourist traps. Mosta is situated in the middle of the island, a busy small town with a famous landmark, Mosta Cathedral, also known as the Rotunda. It's a huge sacred building whose mighty dome can be seen from almost anywhere on the island. It is constructed of Maltese limestone and contains little cement. With the Pantheon as its model, its construction took from 1833 until 1862. 37 meters in diameter, the dome is the third largest in Europe. Only St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome and the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul are larger. Its interior can accommodate a congregation of 12,000. Both its generous dimensions and fine use of traditional Maltese decoration are most impressive. During the Second World War, a miracle took place here. A bomb crashed through the dome during mass. However, it failed to explode and no one was injured. It's difficult to believe that this building was constructed by local villagers rather than by a team of professional architects.
The rugged southern coast of Malta contains small fjord-like features and numerous grottos. The most spectacular of these is the Blue Grotto. From the village of Vidis Zurich, a steep path leads down to the sea and a number of colourful boats. When the weather is suitable, experienced guides take passengers on small boats through a narrow canyon into the grotto where the colour of the water is truly fascinating. St. Julian is a lively village that was once used by the Knights of St. John as a hunting location. The calm scene of tiny fishing boats and nets hanging out to dry can be deceptive. These small bays are the centre of the island's nightlife. At weekends, the young crowd into the various discos and bars. St. Paul's Bay is located in the north of the island. It's a very popular tourist destination. Sandy beaches alternate with a craggy coastline. The shoreline has a profusion of hotels, restaurants, bars and souvenir shops. In 1985, this was a tiny fishing harbour. But today, thousands of people live here and tens of thousands of holidaymakers ensure that it stays well awake throughout the entire year. Legend has it that the Apostle Paul was once stranded here when the ship that was taking him to the Emperor's Court in Rome sank just off the coast. A little further north on the western side of the island and hidden within a steeply sloped bay is the village of Popi. In 1980, Hollywood made a movie about the famous comic strip hero Popeye the Sailor. The scenery here was ideal for their purposes. In this fishing village of misshapen houses, Popeye discovered Newfoundland, or as he called it, Sweet Haven. This was the setting for his colourful adventures. Construction of the set took more than seven months. 165 workers used eight tons of nails and 9,000 litres of paint. As timber is in short supply in Malta, it was imported from Canada. Thus this romantic wooden village was created. After the film crews left the village, it became a popular tourist attraction, so much so that it's been rebuilt twice following two devastating fires. While the village was being built, the important job of finding a suitable cast began that would emulate the famous Popeye characters. Producer Robert Altman finally found the perfect cast. Robin Williams as Popeye, Shelley Duval as Olive Oil, and Paul Smith as Bluto. Gozo, Malta's smaller sister. A green agricultural island with an easy-going lifestyle. 
and the island of Calypso, where Odysseus once lived. The 20-minute journey by ferry boat takes us to another world, one of agriculture and fishing. And here, music is used for a warm welcome. One of the prettiest villages on Gozo is Garb, whose Baroque parish church dominates the main square. Here, it's as though time really has stood still. The Madonna Talvertut church was built in 1755 and along with its grandiose facade is one of the island's most beautiful Baroque buildings. The sculptures on the facade depict faith, hope and mercy. The well-preserved stone cross on the church square dates back to Norman times. But this traditional village west of Rabat was established by the Arabs and in Arabic Rabat means west. Gav possesses very few new buildings. It's a captivating village full of old world charm. Its ancient lanes and houses are reminiscent of the time when Ottoman pirates invaded the island and enslaved most of its inhabitants. Green hills as far as the eye can see. There it is in the distance. The splendid Jagra church. Most of the people here are strict Catholics and the church plays an important role in their daily lives. Even the smallest villages have a relatively large church. At the second weekend of September, one of the largest festivals takes place in this church that dates back to the 19th century. The festival of the Virgin Mary's birth. A well-preserved windmill indicates the production of corn, on which the Order of the Knights of Malta once had a monopoly. It was built in 1724 to replace one powered by donkey. One of the most impressive and oldest prehistoric temples in Malta is situated on the island of Gozo. It's the Gigantija Temple. The megalithic complex consists of two temples surrounded by a wall. It has two entrances. As with each of Malta's other prehistoric temples, between 3,600 to 3,000 years BC, people worshipped stone idols and sacrificed animals in Gigantija. The archaeological excavation of Gigantija that had been undertaken for more than a century finally came to an end in 1936. However, despite the archaeological and scientific knowledge of this site, a further question still remains unanswered. Where did this amazing prehistoric people go after they'd abandoned this region in about 2500 BC? It's one of Malta's many hidden secrets. Tapinu, 
a place of both worship and healing. The church stands out from the beautiful landscape and is the most important place of pilgrimage on these Maltese islands. There was once a 16th century chapel here, from where a 45-year-old farmer's wife, Carmela Grima, witnessed a miracle. On the 22nd of June, 1883, she is said to have heard the voice of the Virgin Mary who ordered her to pray. Shortly afterwards, her friend, Francesco Potelli, also heard the voice. Together they prayed for Francesco's sick mother, who unexpectedly recovered shortly afterwards. Soon, many accounts of miracles and healing circulated from here. Thus, an increasing number of people came to Tapinu. With the assistance of generous donations from Maltese expatriates from around the world, this church was built on the site of a small chapel. Construction of this neo-Romanic basilica took 11 years, and in 1920, the Pope officially acknowledged it. The impressive interior with its colorful glass windows and mosaics that feature a host of angels provides a dignified atmosphere for the faithful. This national sanctuary is named after Pino Gauci, a warden of the former chapel. Duizra Lake is separated from the sea by high cliffs. The lake is surrounded by numerous boathouses and fishing boats. These small motorboats are used to transport passengers through a narrow gap to the open sea. The journey is quite hazardous as a number of sturdy rocks are scattered within the narrow channel. Next, open water, and the journey continues along the steep and rocky coastline. The wild and rugged landscape is a fascinating sight. The rocky walls are in stark yet attractive contrast to the deep blue of the sea. Where possible, the boats venture into various caves. The journey proceeds along the coast to the main attraction on this part of the island. The Azure Window. Here, erosion has created a huge natural wall, a mighty ledge with pillars that create the illusion of a window. It's possible to climb down to the beach, to the Blue Hole. It's a little dangerous, as there's always the possibility of falling rocks. It's as though a giant has been working here with bricks, one side on the land, the other in the sea. The landscape here is constantly changing due to the breaking up of the rocks. However, natural erosion is creating a fascinating landscape. The modest village of Jukija 
as a large church whose dome is almost as large as that in Mosta on the main island of Malta. The inhabitants of this quiet village are proud of their sacred building that they financed themselves and that was consecrated in 1978. A church for eternity. The arduous climb is worth it. From the church tower, there's a superb view across the town and beyond. Seventy-five meters tall, the dome is a replica of the Longinia Santa Maria della Salute in Venice. Today, the tiny village is proud of its remarkable historic church. The interior decoration was created for the common people. Life-size figures depict scenes from the life of Christ and white columns support the huge dome that was built somewhat ingeniously with reinforced concrete. The inhabitants of the village took 20 years to construct this house of God they started by building around an existing parish church that was eventually dismantled. But the side walls, altar and various carved stone angels were preserved and can still be seen today. A large fortification that can be seen from miles around is located on a natural rock plateau above the island's main town. Victoria Rabat. Although the town is now the financial and cultural centre of the island, it has managed to retain the relaxed atmosphere of a small rural community. The town was named Victoria in 1897 on the 60th anniversary of the accession to the throne by the British Queen Victoria. ancient settlement on the hill above the largest arable area on the island is said to date back to the 3rd century BC. Roman rule brought both freedom to the city and also administrative autonomy. The Byzantines expanded the small citadel with additional fortifications. The Arabs enlarged the fortified castle and began with the construction of the small lower town, known in Arabic as Rabat. During invasion by the pirate Dragut, during which Gozo lost almost all its inhabitants, both the citadel and the lower town were badly damaged. It took a further 50 years for a settlement to be re-established on the island. In 1637, each of Gozo's inhabitants were forced to spend the night within the castle. Today, tourists sit in front of the cathedral on the cannon that were once used to protect the castle. Cathedral as well as steep steps dominate the small square within the citadel. The Maltese Baroque master builder Lorenzo Gaffa was unable to build a dome due to insufficient funds. The 
Archbishop of Malta, who at that time was also responsible for Gozo, treated this church with a good deal of thrift. Mass tourism has not yet reached this tiny island. Its wild landscape is still unspoiled and the coastal cliffs are like the gigantic petrified waves of a mysterious ocean. This archipelago that is located between the continents of Europe and Africa is the junction of both past and present. Many people and cultures have left their traces here. An open-air museum beneath the shining sun. 7,000 years of history, crowned by membership of the European Union. A colorful and beautiful island with tales of the sea and noble knights. Malta, a tantalizing pearl set in the very heart of the Mediterranean.